My name is Curtis Peterson. I'm the Senior Vice President of Global Operations for Ring Central. And we operate the largest world's single purpose driven SaaS platform. So we don't do anything else other than business communications for the SaaS space. That's our, our core uh, competency. And today we're going to talk a little bit about how is multi-cloud evolving and how do you work between you moving to multi-cloud and then selecting and buying services from a provider like myself who may or may not be multi-cloud, yet you have to do integrations and data sharing across all these platforms. So we're going to talk about those models and, and, and go into a little detail. Sound good? Okay. All right, that's a little interesting. This is supposed to be a big nerd conference, so I'm hoping that pulls a few more in here, and, and we'll get going. Great. Okay, so this is my slide that, uh, paid for by marketing, uh, as you can tell. So, um, but I don't want to leave it aside on just a marketing phrase. Communications really has changed how businesses work. I'll give two short examples on that one. The first one is remote work. Not too long ago, that was basically unheard of. People can't collaborate unless they're in the same room. People aren't productive unless they can go and talk to one another and do things. And ultimately, I blame email. Because I think it's one of the most horrid forms of communication ever devised by mankind. It was meant to replace post mail and the dreaded corporate memo. Memos were one directional. They were never meant to be daisy chained and replied to 38 times. So they're so far indented, they're only this wide. This was not the means on those. But today's communication systems are rich, vibrant, they're video, they're collaborative, they're any mode, any time, and they really do change how we, how we operate on things. So let's talk about where we started this journey. And we're going to compare business communications and how the cloud is evolving at the same time. So way, way, way back, a long, long time ago in the cloud industry, about 2001, there were basically single cloud instances. If you wanted to do a project, you did it in AWS. Azure didn't exist yet, OK? Or you did it in Rackspace, sort of. And that was about it. And a long, long time ago in the communications world, you literally would call up somebody and say, I want to talk to 1FJ. Now, the reason I remember 1FJ is that was the last three digits of my grandparents' telephone number at their house, which they had maintained since it worked like this. And 1FJ was an address on these boards. You go over panel one, row F and J, you play bingo, plug the wire, you've connected the phone call. And the funny thing is, is if they don't unplug the wire, even if you hung up the phone, it would stay open back in those days. So these are good old days on that. So let's jump forward. We're going into Gordon Gecko days here now, all right? Wall Street movie enthusiast will remember he had that brick phone. Just to put this in perspective, this is $1987 value. This phone is almost 3,000 US. Think about that for a minute. How many, how many phones can you buy for that now that only do this? I don't even know if you can find a flip phone anymore. They're like disposable, right? You go to a store and drug dealers use them and throw them away, right? Okay, so at least we moved past that. But this also became the era of digital switches. So we could talk to people around the world. Pieces of globalization would come on, things along those lines. And this started to transform where we are. If you remember in the movie, he was like, he calls up the, the, the star in the movie that he's, he's mentoring. He says, it's quarter to five in the morning. You're either up working or you already lost, right? So we laugh at that, but how many people have checked their email at least, or their messaging, at least once since they went to bed before 5 a.m. in the morning? Okay, all right. So we laugh at him now, don't we? the cloud continues to fuel how this works and how this changes. And it's a really intersection of business and technology in that space there. So let's come forward now. Smartphone. How many people have a smartphone on them right now? How many have more than one on them right now? 
<laughs> Aha, a couple of bands out there. Exactly, this has really transformed how businesses work. And if you think about the population of the planet, the estimates are there are between three and four billion smartphones on the planet today. That's incredible. Smartphones have been more pervasive than other, any other communications technology ever devised by man. And they're complicated how to do. I actually, uh, I work with a nonprofit organization that builds solar panel systems that can be dropped into villages in, in Africa using helicopters, because there's no roads or paths to get there. And they're used for charging smartphones. The people who own them can make a little bit of money. They sell them to the village. It's almost a communal thing. They make a little bit of money for uh, charging the phones, and they use that money to buy water infrastructure and everything else for the village. So now, why does a village in the middle of Africa that doesn't have a road there go, because almost half of them have a smartphone. That's crazy. Most don't have a refrigerator. Very few, less than 10% have running water inside their living quarters. Almost 0% have sanitary flushing conditions. But they have an iPhone. So we know the world's changing on that front. So look, as we're thinking of this evolving and how you're evolving your business as a CIO today, looking at how am I going to run my loads? Am I going to pick a single cloud provider? Am I going to pull multiple cloud providers together? Am I going to be super adept at how I run my strategy around cloud? How does this work? So I'm coming a little out of communications now. We're just going to talk generically about, about the cloud spaces out there. I think everyone here is pretty familiar with on-premise or your own data center that you own and operate outside your premise. It's siloed. It can be slow. Um, it's capital intensive at the beginning. It's OPEX inten intensive to run and operate at improper scales. So this is where we kind of sit, you know, kind of yesteryear. We're starting to move away from this. A Gartner estimates that most of its clientele, most, the, the plurality of, more than 80%, have begun to leave this model. So, so this is kind of like that first image a little while ago, wires being plugged together, right? We're a little bit out of that at this point. But where did we go? We went to single cloud, and this, is, this was the first evolution of it. So instead of trying to figure out how I take all of my legacy applications and move them into AWS or Azure or, or, or Google Cloud Services, I would take my development teams and I'd say, take your next project and build it in AWS or one of these other cloud services and don't use any of my premise systems. So this was the first evolution of, of cloud hybrid systems in the workplace. And one thing I think analysts got wrong is they told most of us that this was the displacement of premise to the cloud, step one. You're going to take things off your premise and you're going to move them to the cloud and it's going to be cheaper, faster, better. Someone else is going to run it. You're not going to have to worry about it. It'll be up five nines, just like your data center was. OK, so all of those weren't true. None of them maintain that level of reliability. And what it really was was an expansion of systems that the CIO and managers had to operate in those businesses. Most single cloud, is what, again, was an expansion of the existing data set. Yes, they would turn a few servers off on-prem or in the room to claim that they had met some financial objectives, but the, the, the results now in surveying that say that those CIOs were most likely turning those services off with or without the cloud projects going forward. Has anyone ever fudged their ROI on a project they already knew they were turning something off on? No, of course not. Okay, good. I won't have to turn anybody in. Now, the temptation has been the first version of multi-cloud. And I say the temptation because I think this is one of the most evil ways to run your infrastructure, and it's so alluring. And it works something like this. I am I'm a Microsoft Office 365 subscriber and I use ADFS, and I use Dynamics. So I'm going to take all of those services, and I'm going to make a contract with Microsoft Azure, and I'm going to run those there. 
I've got my new customer-facing technology apps that I'm building. They're mobile, they're smart, they're customer engagement, everything we're supposed to do for digital transition. And because my developers want a rapid application development environment, I'm going to run those over here in AWS. Because Azure didn't give me as much pre-built capabilities as AWS did. And then I've got, oh gosh, I've got a ton of storage. Petabytes worth. Okay, so um, AWS is not great at getting data back out. Azure's still scaling. Okay, let's take a look at an IBM for mass storage, right? So um, anybody remember what the first step in a mass storage migration, I'm talking petabytes or larger, first step in a mass migration to the cloud. It's gotta be the cloud, it's awesome, right? It's gonna be super technical, super smart, everything awesome about the cloud that's supposed to exist. And what happens? A giant truck or lorry pulls up to your building and they drag a bunch of ethernet cables out the back and plug it in and suck your data to the truck and drive it to the data center. Are we kidding? This is how this was done? The danger in this siloed multi-cloud though really is around your commercials and your ability to see your data later as things progress. Once these are in here, you've done a lot of hard work. You've done containerization, you've done some other application heavy lifting. Uh, dynamics on-prem and dynamics in the cloud are slightly different. Your hooks are different, your APIs are different. You've got to make all that work, but you are now locked to Azure for that application. You are locked to Azure for that uh, service on there. Good luck on renewal, because they're coming. And there's other business models too. I don't want to pick on any one provider. They all have their cloud lock tools. So what I'm going to propose to you is the real version of multi-cloud requires a little more work on our parts. And this is how, how Ring Central looks at multi-cloud as we deliver the service to you. We look at who has the best solution as a cloud provider in the public cloud space. And if we're the best provider, my own internal team, builds the best cloud, they're the ones that operate that service. But we build that service so it will run there, it'll run in Azure, it'll run in Google, it'll run in Oracle, it'll run in IBM, it'll run in AWS. And now I have choice. I can now start to run that component or those uh, what we call microservices now. I can run those microservices there, I can run them in other places. I can put data in different places. I can do data backup and data resiliency across cloud vendors. Because what we don't always talk about is while AWS and Azure and others have been really pretty good at data protection, if something ever seriously goes wrong in the control plane, the likelihood that you lose your first copy and your second copy within the same vendor actually goes up significantly. So if we're really being honest with ourselves, we want that to be a multi-vendor answer. Now, for those of you who are super advanced in doing this, have done all this work, you've put into the microservices, you've decoupled from the underlying cloud application platforms, and you have true mobility with your data, now you're going to be able to plug in things like AI tools that can see across your entire data sets, regardless of the cloud infrastructure it's in. You're not dependent on one person trying to aggregate all your data to one place. Because if you look at how much data is coming into our enterprises in the next two to five years, you will realize there are not enough lorries or trucks out there to put that data into one place. You are going to have to find tools and data analytics, AI capabilities that can span multiple clouds. Your architecture will depend on it. And that's what we're looking at in this. For those of you who really want to take your negotiation skills to the very next level, put in really good orchestration and compliance on your microservices, and tell your vendors you will bid near real time on where you will run your resources. So Azure might have just put in a new building online, and they have massive amounts of unused boxes. So they might have a really good value proposition for running a component. You don't care where it runs. Your orchestration system can run it in two or three or maybe even any cloud that it wants to operate in. You bid on that instance that runs and, and the amount of space that you intend to bubble it up to, and you bid for those, you bid for those times and slots. That really becomes fun. I'm not saying that you run this like a quant desk at a stock company. That might be a little too 
moving your loads around in microseconds, but um, let, let's move them around weekly, daily, monthly, or even quarterly. That is how we're going to be able to, as purchasers of public cloud infrastructure, maintain our leverage over what is otherwise a very potentially dangerous situation of data lock and application lock down the road. So that's how Ring Central looks at this. We look at this and say, we don't want to be locked into a cloud. Now let's talk about benefits here. We know that premise was expensive and slow. And the first iteration of cloud was wonderful, right? We sped up our development. More specifically, we sped up that project that we put into the cloud. We're able to release continuously. It doesn't have the baggage of our on-prem. And we lowered our cost and complexity. We don't run it anymore. We don't have to deal with the hardware anymore. We're not repairing boxes in the middle of the night. You don't have to do any of that. You've got guys, got guys out there doing that. And then boom, it starts to grow on you. You get more and more of these. And unfortunately, those benefit curves invert themselves. If you're siloed multi-cloud, now your cost of maintaining that starts to go up. Your leverage and capability of being able to, to build a portfolio that can compete with different cloud providers is gone. So enter the true multi-cloud, which is the state we've all been choosing over here, which is shedding all of that workload of infrastructure, infrastructure as a service, core networking services, the things that have really been dumbed down to the layer zero of the network, and being able to optimize our purchasing around those models so we can be fast, nimble, and agile. That's the state we want to be able to get into. So here's our multi-cloud. I really quickly, I had my 11-year-old son in my, my office not too long ago. He's not very sure what I do. Um, as most children, I'm sure, don't know what their parents really do. And I just simply asked him, I said, what's multi-cloud? And he said, can you spell it for me, Daddy? And I wrote it up on my whiteboard, and I said, it's multi-cloud. And he says, well, I think that just increases the chances to rain. <laughs> and I thought, you know what? When you live somewhere where you need some rain, that's exactly what multi-cloud is, and it's a good thing. So look, how does this tie into what Ring Central is doing? As we said, we look at our data and our, uh, and our platform that we're operating for you in business communications, and we want to be able to use the best AI, the best storage, localized storage where we can. We want to be able to deliver a cost-effective solution. We want to be able to deliver you messaging solutions that say, I don't care how much data you put in here. What, what, what data got? Load it all up all day long. You want the data back? Fine, we have APIs for that. There's not a separate charge associated with that. That's the kind of clouds we want to build, and that's what we're able to do by running the fourth generation of what we call the cloud architecture in there, which is that true multi-cloud architecture in there. The other part is we maintain our speed of innovation. And I like to say that the version of Ring Central that you would get today would be the worst version you would ever get. Um, with major releases, you know, on, on such a regular basis that that, that my team is deploying code 24 by seven. Don't let that scare you, it works fine, we don't go down. So, sometimes we lose a little sight of why we're doing these cloud projects. I've been in, in some of these projects where we go to RFP, go to tender, we're sitting there negotiating numbers, what size instances we want, how much we're willing to pay per petabyte or megabyte, whatever we're, scale we're negotiating at, and we forget that we're there to change our business and how we interact with customers. So I do say that most people need to come back and just kind of take a look at the big picture. What are we really doing digital transformation for in most businesses? And overwhelmingly, you told us it's employee productivity. And then you came back and said, my second thing is customer interaction. I'll tell you, these things are inseparable. There's a reason that they're one, two. And sometimes they show up two, three, but they're always next to each other. And we know this, right? Happy employees, happy customers, uh, and vice versa. So these are inseparable, I think, in the stack of innovation on there. And if you move on down, it is actually creating the new business models. And what did we start this presentation with? The first reason we went to the cloud was now your fifth, sixth reason on the chart down here, below 50% of why we're going to the cloud now. So your strategy of buying and architecting the cloud has to move along with that. 
So look, as I mentioned, when we can see all the data, we can go across multiple clouds, you're not restricted on being able to put in things like real-time transcription, AI, the ability to see all the data at once, the ability to look at multiple applications. That's not just true for what Ring Central is doing. If you apply this to your cloud as well, it'll expand those capabilities for you to see data across all of your cloud instances, which I think is the key for the next evolution as we get into edge computing and we get overloaded with data in the next two to five years. So, Closing comments here, we mentioned that uh, Ring Central is in this business as a SaaS provider. Our product addresses on the right-hand side both the customer version of what we talked about a minute ago, improving customer relationship and the customer experience, and also improving the employee experience, giving them tools they like to use, not flipping through five, six tools to communicate with their colleagues, but being able to stay in one pane of glass that's integrated into their work. And for customers to be able to reach their clients in any medium they want, whether it's um, Twitter or Facebook or WhatsApp or Apple business messaging or an old fashioned phone call like I typically do. All of those have to be able to work both with employees and customers to really see business communications going in the future. And to do that, you really have to be truly multi-cloud. Appreciate your time, thank you very much. Our mission is to make this simple and effortless. If you'd like to see how we do it, Ruth's right behind you, or you can come talk to me after the presentation. Thank you.